Another day. Here we go. I had to drop my truck off this morning. We decided to go for coffee. I ran into an old neighbor of mine who lives just around the corner. It's a real treat when you get to sit with your uh, some of the seniors of the population. I love, I love hearing them talk. Love it. Very intelligent man. Very successful man. Hand built. Hand built a sawmill. He's got all these old Model A trucks and shit and hot rods in his shop. I don't know how old he is. Late 70s. And he still hand builds every single part. And he just painted this 1932 pickup truck or something. Learned how to paint himself. Everything. It's crazy. Real interesting to hear from our senior... Uh, our senior citizens. I love it. Now, I'm going to get right into it. And here's some people speak without me babbling. Okay, what's this? This is very short with a photo. Just thought I would share this photo with you. It's off of a video somebody posted. Somebody saw this being from a ways away and took a photo of it while hiking. I'm not 100%, I'm not 100 sure of the legitimacy, but the being is quite tall to be faked. You can use my name. Ron Sunahorsky. I think that would probably freak anybody out seeing that. Don't know. Having a clue. Might trigger somebody's memory. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. All right, here we go. What's this one? Another one. This is titled My Puzzle. Steve, you're welcome to use my name. I am Joe Morris, and I've written in before thanking you and Edgar, Edgar for about solving my puzzle. My puzzle was simple. What did I bump into in the CAS area on Barksdale Air Force Base that was projecting terror into my soul? I can't emphasize how much terror I was in. While you and Edgar were relaying to us information, it became apparent that the Sasquatch people have partially unknown DNA. I make an assumption that the DNA is demonic of some kind. The U.S. military is allegedly working with aliens, which I believe are demonic forces. It is my belief that I somehow ended up near one of these demonic things, and it decided to terrorize me. Sure, I still have lots of questions, but I am satisfied with the answers of what happened at, in the CAS area. To this day, it is the most terrified I've ever been. I'd like to learn more about the entity and the trackers but information is very slim. In time, I'm sure I will learn more about it, but for now, it's another puzzle to be solved. Thank you for your, thank you for what you do for all of us. Take care, Joe Morris. Okay, Joe, good to hear it's helping, man. Always good to have emails to share with everyone that uh, this is helping. All right, this one is titled Bigfoot in Arizona? Question mark. Steve, while I have doubts this will get through, since I know you have a deluge of emails and can't possibly read them all, but maybe this gets through. Raised in the woods of Louisiana and finished growing up on the mean streets of Phoenix in the 1950s. Used to camp out in the Mogollon Rim. Oh, isn't it pronounced Mogollon or something? Sorry. In Arizona Mountains. One night I was in my makeshift shelter consisting of dead pine limbs with the needle still attached, all brown. It was past midnight, and I was just laying there enjoying the quiet and serenity, staring out at the broad array of stars in the Arizona sky. And suddenly, the whole shelter shook, and I heard a noise that wasn't a growl, but something. I don't know how to describe it. It wasn't that loud, but a deep guttural sound that only lasted a second or two. Anyway... I bailed instantly, and there was nothing there. I could see fairly well because of the moonlight. I also heard nothing else. There were lots of big pine trees there, so it would have been easy to hide. And whatever it was, it had to be a pretty bit. It had to be pretty big to shake my 
whole shelter. I dismissed it at the time, figuring it was a big wolf or some other large critter, maybe a bear. And it could have been, I don't know. It wasn't until I began watching your shows that my considerations widened. I've never thought before then that my encounter was anything other than a critter of some kind. Then, a few years back, I heard of people citing a creature that fit the Bigfoot description on the Mogollon Rim in the area I was in that night. That, together with hearing all the stuff on your channel, now makes me doubt my earlier assumptions. I'm now wondering if one of these creatures just didn't want me in his territory and was inducing fear. It definitely did that, and I didn't go back to sleep that night. I've been seriously investigating the subject now for several years, reading, watching, analyzing, thinking, listening to the credible and the incredible, the bizarre and the flat-out weird. The only thing out of bounds is some is the same ones you are fed up with. The, quote, I'm going to be famous for videoing a Sasquatch, end quote, people. So much clickbait in that arena. I've looked deep enough into all of it, from UFOs to creatures that are appearing all over our planet, such that I feel reasonably certain I know what these things are and how they are. Not sure their ultimate purpose, but fairly certain how they got here. Big questions for me. Big questions for me anymore with them is not how they got here, but what's their goal? Who controls them? Is there a somebody, or sorry, is there a quote, someday, end quote, purpose for them? A use for some kind by some sinister agents like our U.S. government? Hate to raise that question. I never thought I'd ever say something like that, but my government is an uncontrollable monstrosity whose depths and corridors are endless, and no one in Washington knows where they lead or whom they lead. There's not a simple, easy answer to it all. It's a fairly complex subject, in part because it involves our government, which seems to be engaged in some pretty devious, dangerous, and downright evil stuff. The kind of stuff that chills your guts at night. The sad reality is that other governments are a carbon copy of some of this stuff. For a guy who's got a handle on a lot of this, definitely more than the average Joe, look up Timothy Al... Timothy Aberino, A-B-E-R-I-N-O. The guy bailed from the U.S. and went to live in the jungles of the Amazon at a young age. He's seen things and conducted extensive interviews with natives out there who live in the jungle. He speaks their language regarding the stuff they have seen, including uh, the recent attempted abduction of a young teen girl by what the natives call the skin peelers. His background is pretty extensive, and he's done some dead bang serious investigations. Worth a look. See to get some of your answers you're seeking. And if you want to pick the brain of an old guy slowing, slowly sliding his way out of this world, feel free to email or call. We'll tell you what I know, and some what I suspect, and some of which I hope to God isn't true. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I don't even have time to frickin'. I don't have time to phone anybody right now. I'll guarantee you that. But if you are sitting there and you got nothing to do and you want to give us a few little tidbits, email me back. Because you just got through once. All right. I'm in the I'm in the recent section of my emails right now. Skin peelers. What a handle that is. Skin peelers. And the governments. You know what? For shits and giggles, if you want to look at both sides of the coin right now, apparently North America, you know, they're all trying to paint a certain couple of countries as the most evil ones in the world. All you have to do is select a few countries, do this on your own, so you can find out yourself, so some dick like me doesn't have to say it online and then trigger you into blowing a gasket. All you have to do is find out who has the most military bases spread around the world. Check that one out. And then also, do a little search on your own and find out what country has bombed and killed people the most. Say in the last, doesn't even matter. Go uh, 20 years if you want, or 50 years. Find those, find those answers on your own. I challenge you to do that. That's all I got to say on that right now. I got to bite my lip because I could probably keep going on. It's not hard, you guys. Now, moving along. All right, now I have a substantial amount of emails 
in a folder, another folder in here in my notes, they're all over the place, that aren't marked as read, all right? Now, if I do read one that's been read, you seriously don't have to email me to tell me that I've already read one from yesterday at two o'clock, all right? That's not a worthy activity of your time, trust me. If I read one that's been read, whoopsie berries. If it makes you angry, <laughs> you can get a refund for your where you bought your ticket to be here, right? Now, here we go. No title. Doesn't say when it was sent in, nothing. Hi, Steve. My story doesn't have anything to do with Sasquatch. However, my experience is not unlike a couple of the hair-raising emails sent in by members of your audience. My experience took place near Shudik Pen Peninsula, Acadia National Park, Winter Harbor, Maine. At the time, 1966, I was in the Navy, stationed at a small base known as Winter Harbor, Maine. The area is remote and rugged. Shudik Peninsula, S-C-H-O-O-D-I-C Peninsula, sometimes called Shudik Point, sticks right out into the North Atlantic. There were two sections of the base, the main section where everyone lived, and the other section where the operational part of the base was situated. The two sections of the base were roughly 10 miles apart, and we used a large school bus to transport each watch to and from the work site. Every eight hours, the watch was changed. Each watch consisted of roughly 20 sailors, 10 traveled by Navy bus, with the other 10 using their own car. As luck would have it, I was volunteered to drive the bus for my watch. At the risk of sounding a bit hyperbolic, a couple of nights earlier, there had been a UFO sighting by one of the other watches. The sighting came in in the form of a single white light. Excuse me. I should point out that this base was considered to be very high security. No one without a proper naval security group, the secret clearance was allowed anywhere. Sorry, no one without a proper naval security group, top secret clearance was allowed anywhere near this base. At any rate, it was my turn to drive the bus back to the barracks. I can remember that everyone on the bus was in a great mood because we had the next three days off. A couple of the guys were joking that we were right in the area where the UFOs had previously been spotted. Then, out of nowhere, a large, bright, white light appeared through the trees about 200 feet out over the water. At first, I thought it might have been a flare. I slowed the bus down just to see what happened. The light slowed down with us. Mayhem broke out on the bus. After another minute or so, the light moved up and away from us, and then it disappeared from sight. After that, things calmed down a bit, and after another few seconds... I looked in the rearview mirror, and there it was, directly behind us, up close and personal. I nearly shit myself. The light was right over the road, mirroring our course and speed, making no noise. It was with great relief that the main gate and guard shack came into view. I was concentrating on my driving and not the UFO. I did not see it leave. According to my freaked out watchmates, the light just went up and away. I informed our commanding officer's office about what happened, and I heard some rumors about scrambling jets from Bangor Air Force Base. And I don't believe anything ever came of it. End of email. There you go. Another one of a bright white light, which people now call possibly orbs. Right? The bright white light. I know nothing of myself firsthand, only from what the people share. And I trust the people more than anybody. Now, sounds kind of funny. I trust the people more than anybody. <laughs> oh, India. I think we heard this one, didn't we, from India? We've had a couple from India with photos. I did read this for sure. This is quite a while ago. I remember reading it. All right. All right.
right, here we go. No title. This is a 2020. Hey, Steve. I love your videos. You seem like a real genuine guy and a really good hunter. Anyway, my story is my grandfather's story. Who, really beautiful place, is on the western side of Wyoming in the Rockies. My family has spent many generations hunting across the states, but mostly in Wyoming, Montana, and Colorado. This is not my story about my grandfather's. His name is Ron Martin, and my grandfather is a really true down-to-earth country boy. Anyway, my grandfather went hunting in a place north of Alpine and below Jackson Hole in a place called Smoky Valley. Unfortunately, now that place is currently in flames, but that's not the point. He was hunting for elk. He had been trapped. Okay, no punctuation. Sorry, you guys. Let me do that one more time. But that's not the point. He was hunting for elk. He had been tracking this herd of bulls and two cows for a while. And he finally got the chance to go and try to get the bull he has had his eye on. So he packed up by himself and went off. He said, he set up camp at the top of the other side of the valley, which he said he had never hunted before. And on the first day, he saw signs of the herd all over the valley, but no elk. It's getting dark, so he walked back to camp. As he walked, as he was walking back, he said he felt the hair on the back of his neck turn to wire, as if he was being watched on the way back. The first day, he walked back on the same trail he walked going up on, when he saw a footprint in the mud next to his older boot print. He said it had five toes and was almost twice as big as his boot. He started studying the tracks and where they came from and where he thought they were going. He said that he followed the tracks about 30 yards from the first print and he had found a bunch of broken pine limbs 10 feet off the ground with the same tracks around it he seen before. He saw in the mud what looked like a scuffle of some sort around the broken limbs. When he looked closer, he saw blood. He touched his finger to it and he said it was still warm. Then he noticed that the tracks went back towards his camp, but they looked more deep in the mud as if whatever it was was carrying something. When he finally got back to camp, it had been torn apart. The cooler full of jerky and whatever else was in there was thrown 20 feet high and stuck in a tree. But he saw no signs of any animals that could do this. But he still slumbered up and was excited for the next day. <laughs> oh my god. I don't want to drag it on, so I'll, I'll say that he, the next few days he saw nothing except a grizzly bear. But there were a lot of signs. There were a lot of signs of the herd I was talking about before. But other than that, nothing. The next day, he said that he was glassing from the top of the valley for a little while and saw the herd of elk he had been talking about. He watched them for a little bit and noticed that all of the elk were on edge. One of the cows with one calf, especially, he took note and kept watching. And all of a sudden, the herd got spooked and ran up the valley towards my grandpa. He got excited, walked down about 200 yards, and sat and waited with his 308. <clears throat> he saw the big bull elk. He saw this time the year before. He waited for a clear shot. This bull had 10 points on one side and 12 on the other with a drop tine or whatever you call. Sounds like a hammer bull. I can't remember yards away and it dropped and then ran. He waited a little to go after it. The bull had ran up the valley and down the other side and fell over some rocks and broke his left antler. He was packing it out and went the short way to camp. He came back to get the rest of it after about three trips back and forth, packing that batch out of there on his last one. He came back and the rest of the elk was gone. He had already grabbed most of the meat and the head. He saw where it had been dragged and he sat there for a minute and thought about going after it when he heard a scream like no other animal he knows can make. He said he knows it's not a mountain lion because he spent years with them being a problem on his ranch. He walked up the valley a couple of miles back to camp without his last quarter of meat when a rock the size of a shoe was thrown at him and almost hit him in the head. 
He made it back safely and home safely. My grandfather's not the type to lie about stuff like that. He is really true down to earth. He also said that in the same week, he killed the elk. He was in a little half saloon style restaurant. And he had a few drinks and was going to drive up the mountain home when he got up the when he got up, the bar was empty. There's no punctuation. Okay, sorry you guys. When he got up, the bar was empty. He thought that was weird because it had four to five people in there, which was kind of a lot being in where we live, but he was getting in his truck when he saw a huge blinding light right above him. And then he said the next thing he knew, he was woke up in his truck, rolling up the mountain road, going home five miles an hour. Crazy, right? You don't have to believe me, but I know my gramps would not lie. My name is Dane, and thank you for listening to my story. I'd like if you would tell it, but you do not have to. Told, shared, and with lots of respect to you and your grandfather, I'm glad you shared that with us. Bright light, losing time, right? Rocks being thrown. The scream. Elk. Common patterns straight across the board. And another. Okay, who else? What else? Read this one. I know I read that one. Sucks when everything gets uh, all uh, messed up, right? But it's out of my control. It's unfortunate, but oh well. At least we're still here, still got the channel, and we still have all the emails. So, all right, this one's titled Bosnia. Hello, good morning. My name is... Don't use my name. Blank, blank. I live in Portugal. I was in the military for 10 years. I've been watching your videos about Bigfoot, and I have a story to tell. It's a brief story without major dramas, but I want to share this information with the world because I feel that I have already kept it too long. 2001, I went on a mission in Bosnia where I got to know practically the whole territory in patrols and other missions. In one of them, while we were traveling from Sarajevo to Mostar on a road in the middle of a valley where a river ran, almost at the end of the day, I noticed a movement on the opposite slope, about 300 meters. When I started to see what movement it would be, I didn't even want to believe what I was seeing. At first I thought it was someone, a sniper, dressed in a ghillie suit, but it was impossible to be, because it was huge. It was over 2.30 meters high, covered with hair, and the movements were heavy but fast. It didn't carry a gun or a backpack, as it appeared in the sunset light, so it disappeared through the trees. Nobody else saw it, and I didn't tell anyone else either, because surely nobody would believe it. I know there are more reports during the war. I know there are more reports during the war, but I didn't believe it until it happened to me. Thanks. Bosnia. There you go, other side of the planet. And if you are still following this channel... We want to hear about more reports in Bosnia. If you got them. If you can recall. All over it. Bosnia. I think they got the same timber we do, don't they? Mountains. Here's another one. Hi Steve, my story is not a sighting, but something scared me out of the woods. I live in New Brunswick, Canada, near Edmonston. On the east side of Canada. I'm right across the river from Madawaska, Maine, US. I'm 60 year old I'm 60 years old now. Haven't hunted in about four years. Got disabled around that time. I never was afraid of the woods. I know most animals we have here will run away before you see them. Don't have a gun. Not even a knife. Not even a knife. I don't know if there are any Bigfoot around here. I know one was seen on the shore of the Atlantic Ocean about two hundred miles from here. And it was a native that saw it. He was laughed at. It made the news, but no pictures. What happened to me was not a sighting, but a feeling. Like they say, the hair on the back of my head turned to wire. I was about a mile from my truck and a half mile from home, so I 
made a beeline for my house. When I got home, I was wet from the head to toe, not from rain. I never heard any sound behind me, but the feeling I had was get the hell out of there. Have you ever heard of anyone that had the same experience? At that time, I didn't know about your website. Love what you do. Keep up the good work. Feel free to say my name, Jack Nadeau. Jack, this is sound well, if this is sound well back, you obviously know you've got the answer to that question already a bunch of times over, right? A bunch of times over. Excuse me. Okay, I don't know what this is about, but there's a whole bunch of somethings in here. What do we got? Mark this as red. Quote, stopped in to visit with Indiaki today, and we discussed this some, and he convinced me to put up my experiences. Y'all are probably going to think I'm nuts. First, first, a little background. I've lived in the German Ridge slash Goose Town Ridge area of Perry, Colorado, the last 20 plus years. Spent a bunch of time outside at night, really always been a night owl. I used to work nights a lot, so on weekends I try to keep the same schedule and hate watching TV. So my big stress relief was to sit outside for hours chilling. Even as a kid, I was as comfortable outside at night as I was in the day. Maybe even more so. So anyway, over the last couple of years I've been outside at night and have heard something. I know what coyotes, bobcats, foxes, owls, and about any other critter that roams at night sound like. Even listen to recordings of mountain lions and, and few other non-native species. And whatever it was, it wasn't anything I've ever heard before. The neighbors all know I like to be outside at night. And I've asked if I'd heard anything odd. One thing I've noticed is that I'll be outside and can hear dogs barking, bugs singing, owls hooting, all the normal night sounds, and it'll suddenly go dead silent. I mean, can hear a pin drop silent. Not a single natural sound. Then almost a moaning. Sometimes off in the distance, sometimes fairly close. The hair on my neck will stand straight up. Like I said, I like to be outside at night. Sometimes at night I'll sit out on the deck and just watch and listen. Look at the stars. Watch for meteors and satellites. Listen to the night shift animals. However... There have been times I've felt like I was the one being watched, and not in a good way. The deer come up in the yard regularly. Owls are in trees close by. Fox wander by often. They know I'm there. They know I know they're there. No big deal. But every once in a while, the old fifth sense says there is something else watching. Even the boss gets a weird vibe once in a while. And after some of the things she's told me about the, about the mill serps... I brought home before they even came out of the case. I've learned to listen, like being watched through the living room window. The living room window is eight feet off the ground. I can barely reach the sill standing under it. Back then, I was working nights. There was a couple of times when she called me and had come home. Something had disturbed her so. Even the wildlife know when something's up. I have a few deer that come in the yard daily. But more than once, I've been watching them from inside, and all of a sudden, they go on alert, all looking at the same spot. I look also, but because of the shade in the woods, I won't see anything. The deer won't spook, but will make their way to the woods opposite, and will maintain a visual on a particular spot. I expect to see a yolk pop out of the woods, but nothing. We dispose of our food scraps in the edge of the woods, so raccoons and possums come in and have to feast. I've seen several coons chomping down and then instantly go into a panic and take off like their pants are on fire. You gain nothing. And the coons don't come back till the next night. Now let me say, I've never seen anything clear enough to say Bigfoot, Squatch, whatever you want to call it. The one time I've actually seen anything, I was taking the trash out to the shed and something large went crashing back into the woods. Our resident deer just don't spook when I go outside. They're so used to me being around me being around, and they got my attention right. So that got my attention right now. Sorry. Whatever it was, it was big. Large limbs being broken, small trees shaking, lots of noise. 
the direction it was coming from, started a short distance back in the woods from the backyard, then went straight up the hill and over the top. It covered well over 300 feet of very rough, steep terrain in a matter of only a few seconds. In the time I've lived here, I've never seen a deer go up the hill like that. They tend to follow the little shelves and climb the easier places to the next shelf. This went straight up. Now, what did I see? All I got was a quick glimpse through an opening in the leaves of something much larger, three or four times larger than a deer and very dark. Almost black, but not quite. Then there's been a time or two I've caught a whiff of something stinky. Best way I can say it was a combination of wet, dirty dog, skunk, and B.O. Nasty. I never smelled that by itself, but have when I've had that feeling. Been a couple of instances fairly close by where animals have disappeared. Dogs go to chase something off into the woods, then never come back. Calves and goats simply disappear, like they never existed. In my I M E, I M E, if coyotes had got them, there'd be something like blood, hair, hide, bones, something. But in these instances, nothing at all. Used to when I go out in the deck at night. The only thing I'd take along would be a cup of coffee or a big glass of tea, depending on the weather. But here lately, when I go out, which isn't near as often as I used to, I tote along some artillery. That may be no biggie to a lot of us folks here, but I carry more... But I... Sorry. But I carry more sitting on the deck than when I go to the big city. That should tell you that whatever is out there has got me a little shook. <laughs> I'll say and think about putting out some game cams around the homestead like I do every year, but this year I'm procrastinating. Then you wrote something in a foreign language I don't know. <laughs> Follow-up post. Quote, the plot thickens. I was at work today talking with one of my co-workers about this as his parents lived down the road a bit from me. We were talking, and lo and behold, his mom and grandma walk in. He has me tell them about it. His mom, absolutely shocked and horrified. Grandma, who's nodding her head while I was talking, starts to tell us about what she has heard and tells about some of the old sightings from back in the 60s and 70s, as well as some of what she was told when she was a young one. And another follow-up post. Quote, don't have a lot of time to post about it tonight, but I had the opportunity to talk with co-worker's mom, who lives down the road from me a bit, and his grandma, his grandma who grew up not far from here. Let's just say my experience has not been unique. Oh, another quote. Thank you, John. With your permission, I'd like to forward this to Steve Isdall. Yes, feel free. Okay, so I got a whole... He's giving me some text messages. I guess they must have been copied and put in here that way. Yes, feel free. Last post. I heard a second story a couple days ago at work. Local guy who comes in as often... Who comes in often has a bunch of goats and a couple of great Pyrenees to watch over them. He had a goat disappear a couple weeks ago. The rest of the goats stayed in their goat house for three days. And the dogs were right there with them. As the crow flies, he might be a mile from my place. So, this is what is taking place in rural southern Indiana right now. Thanks again, Steve. God bless. Gary. Indiana... Indiana? Yeah, we've had a lot from there. We've had a lot of a lot of recent actually, I think, from Indiana too, isn't it? Hasn't it been? Every state though. Nobody's been left out. Even even Hawaii's had a few sightings. Go figure. Yes, they have. For those who say, no, they haven't. Yes, they have. What do we got here? This is titled Disabled Vet. Marked as red. Well, shit. You talked me into it. I'm a disabled army veteran. I've seen shit and been through shit. Back 20 years ago at my parents' house, I lived in the woods. Guns, dogs, and me. They live on a small river in the thumb of Michigan. I had a giant Malamute with me, my best friend. At the furthest part of the property, we were just enjoying the river and walking. 
I noticed something like a brown bear running up the bank of the river on the other side. My dog didn't react, but I thought nothing of it. After a while, I didn't think about it and told my parents. I always saw all the wildlife, but it was different. I don't know what it was, and neither did they. I've always thought about it and thought, and though brown bears aren't in Michigan, not a dog or a wolf or anything I could honestly point to. It was around six feet. This summer I visited with my kids and and we met all my family up there. The neighbors had a pond next to the river, like right there. So every day we took the kids down to fish. With me being the main outdoor guy, I liked fishing everything, so... I set some bank lines to get the snapping turtles and relocate them. The neighbors really appreciated it. So we stayed up late one night, and after everyone went to bed, I forgot I checked the lines. So without worry, I set out with just a flashlight. It's my woods. I grew up there. I know literally almost every tree and rock. I'm a combat vet, so I can't stop being vigilant and paying attention to all things. It's about 300 meters down to the end of the property. Halfway down. I thought, wow, I never go without a dog or a gun, but, but hey, it'll be fun. So I sat about 200 meters, sorry, so at about 200 meters, I felt really uneasy and started to smell rancid meat, but kept going. Now, I've listened to you and David Plytus for a while at that point, but figured it was my backyard. As I go further, all sound cut out. Nothing. Then, wow, my heartbeat, so effing loud it hurt. I stopped, and I heard my mind screaming, run. All the hairs stood up on end. I felt like a mouse in a snake pen. It was crazy. Then I felt the need to escape. I don't know how to even explain it. The intense urge and adrenaline to boot. What the F? Run. I turned and ran. I was the fastest runner in my battalion, and as I ran, I heard it behind me or next to me. All I thought was get home, jump in the door, grab the gun, and shoot. I've been shot, blown up. I've never been that scared ever. As I jumped through the door, the dogs flipped. Wow, I made it. My dogs heard me and woke up asking what happened. I told them they believed all of it, as they follow y'all as well. A couple days they checked the lines and one of them was straightened. It was in a one eighth inch spring steel. What the F? I told my wife and she thought I was crazy. And well mocked me. So my best friend bought a house up river a couple miles from my parents. So we went over to visit and she told all of them how nuts I was. They believed me. They went on to tell all of the giant footprints they have found down by the river and all odd things they've seen and heard living there. Excuse me. And different stories they've heard. That got her scared. She's a total believer now. Sorry the shit's so long. Thank you for what you do. You're no shit helping people and bringing out the truth. Keep it up. Moral of the story. Take guns and dogs and no it's not just us out there and be safe semper paratus sean lynch sean appreciate that email man you put us right there i think somebody's here Whew. all right i actually just was away for about two hours babbling my freaking face off with uh, Darren, Darren Clark stopped by, and he actually brought a made a handmade cedar bench for uh, Sarah. Such a kind, kind thing to do. And he also dropped dropped over a donation to help buy some food for some hungry kids here. Super cool. And of course, I only had about you know a huge, large coffee in me, so I babbled his freaking ear off <laughs> while he was while he was here. Funny. When you get socked away in this man cave by yourself for so long, somebody comes by, you start talking like you haven't been able to talk to anybody forever. <laughs> anyway, so carrying on. Getting back into it. Now, this email, do you remember, what was it, one or two ago? I screwed up on an email. It was about the guy who was overseas and saw the corpse split down the side. 
Remember? Well, here is the first email I received before that. Listen to this. Dear Steve, my name is James Boggs, and I live in Exchange, West Virginia. West Virginia. I'd like to share my thoughts on this subject of Bigfoot. For your listeners' benefit, this is only my conclusions. My experiences start as a child when I awoke to find a large pair of red eyes looking at me inside my bedroom. <clears throat> I couldn't move or scream. Despite my terror, I went back to sleep. After high school, I joined the U.S. Army and served in the Gulf War. I saw many strange things, including a corpse split down one side with no bone slash blood, but internal organs still present. How crazy is that? <clears throat> split down one side with no bones or blood, but the organs were still present. No idea of the cause. I guess that's when I probably knee jerk and emailed him back or something. I was eventually medically discharged. I went to, I eventually returned to West Virginia where I began to study the whole paranormal. I've since seen many strange things. I've noticed many correlations of these things. It seems Bigfoot orbs, UFOs, and phantoms go hand in hand. It also seems to me they occur around certain things. These include, but are not limited to, anxiety, anger, depression, drug and alcohol use, and etc. These usually spill over, and other people in the area see them as a side effect. I believe they are supernatural in their origin. Many have noted that, quote, there are rules, end quote, to the game. Therefore, there is a lot, sorry, therefore, there is a controlling mechanism or being. Bigfoot scare you, and you emit fear, but why? I can only guess. What if something wants you to be afraid, to fear, hate, and live in terror? Surely this seems to be the agenda. What if this non-human intelligence has been in contact with, slash, our governments, are aware of it, and are seeking knowledge from it that they do not want us to know about? <clears throat> Why do politicians and the elite seem to torture kids? Why do the loudest among them seem to secretly worship ancient gods? I think you were right. Something big is coming. I hope it is for good of man. I think you can read between the lines and what I believe the non-human intelligence is. As I have heard you speak of orbs, I'm enclosing herewith a photo of one I took from my porch. You can share this if you wish, photo, and email, because I already don't care what people think. Also, I saw this orb in spring, and the houses around this area are having Bigfoot, Dogman, and other weird tracks show up around their homes since. This world is truly a strange place. Sincerely, James Boggs. And there we go. I'll post this up on the video. Zoom in on it. And there is what looks exactly like what people describe as an orb. And there we go. Appreciate you, man. If you're still hanging out, James, and if you got anything else you want to share with the people here through me, <clears throat> excuse me, please come back and do it. Very interested to hear from you again. Excuse me. All right, this one is in large font, <laughs> and it looks really long. But you know what? I'm going to go in and I'm going to do this. And then I have to get ripping. All right, this is titled Steve. <clears throat> well, it's not titled. It starts off with Steve. I've been watching a YouTube channel. And I like the way you present the facts from the people who send you their encounters. Please find my encounter in this email below. Written as best I could for easier reading. October 9th, 2020. Never cry Sasquatch. My encounters were 45 years ago when I found myself driving the Alaska Highway from Edmonton, Alberta to Whitehorse in the Yukon with three other people in the car. Rat it. <laughs> Hold on. All right, here's one. Another one. 
Tuttle, this is red. Steve, I've been watching the channel for about a year now, and what you're doing here is a good thing. Just having some place to tell our experiences without ridicule or eye-rolling responses can sometimes be enough. Most of us didn't ask or seek out what happened to us. With that said, here is what I wasn't looking for. It was in the spring turkey season of 2012, and like every spring since, my daughter was eight years old when we were together hunting wild turkeys in southern Indiana. Indiana again. This particular trip, we were hunting on a decommissioned military proving grounds that had been turned over to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and is now a refuge. 58,000 acres of beautiful oak hardwoods, prairie grasses, and swamps. The National Guard still maintains an air wing there, and they fly A-10 Warthog training runs there all the time. If you've ever heard, if you've never heard, an A-10 on approach at 200 feet of altitude, it's enough to make you hit the dirt. I only mention the Air Force Base because that's where we were, right next, right next to it in Area 14. I had maps scouted an old abandoned two-track road in the middle of our area and thought it would be a great strutting zone for Big Toms. But halfway in towards the old road, we came to the edge of a very deep ravine. That's when I got the most overwhelming feeling of dread and fear. Something was telling me, do not go down there. I took a map reading and the only way to get to my target spot was to cross this ravine. So I called a series of yelps to see if it was worth it and immediately got a gobble on the ridge top on the ridge top across the ravine. So I shrugged off the fear and down into the darkness we went. And mind you, the sun is in full glory, and this 180-foot deep ravine is, is canopy dark as shit. We get almost to the bottom, and it hits me again, that feeling. Except this time, it's not, don't go down there, it's, get the hell out. That's when the first tree broke off. My daughter, who hasn't said a word, says, quote, That sounded like a tree broke in half, not falling over, end quote. We hit the bottom, which was dry creek bed, and start up the other side, and another tree snaps, and then another. And I said, what the hell is that? And my daughter, who was 16 at the time, says, Sasquatch. I didn't even have time to process what she said, and the most powerful, high pitch screech slash scream that lasted what seemed like minutes goes off about 40 yards to our six o'clock in the creek bed. I froze, and she jacked a shell, and I touched her on the shoulder and motioned up to the top of the ravine, and we started climbing. It took us a few minutes to reach the top, and during that climb, we heard at least two more trees break. So now we're out of the ravine, but on the wrong side from the truck. I checked my map, and the only way out without going back across that ravine was to walk the old two-track literally to the Air Force Base fence and along it to the gravel road we came in on, about a two-mile swing. Just as we are returning to head towards the base, we hear crashing in the woods from where we just were. Three white-tailed deer bust out of the woods with their eyes wild, with fear run across the two-track and into the woods on the other side. That's when we get scream number two. It was further away, but just as terrifying. We made the walk out, hardly talking at all, and to this day, she doesn't like to talk about it. I can't go in the woods anymore without thinking about that day. I refuse to go alone, and my love of hunting has really taken a beating. I still do go, but not like I used to. I used to eat, sleep, and drink, honey. One more thing that happened that that day I just thought of. You had to check out of the property office when you leave the refuge. And when we were checking out, one of the staff asked my daughter if we saw anything. And my daughter said, three scared deer and heard a Sasquatch. He smiled and chuckled. But I noticed his buddy in the cubicle behind him rolled his chair out and looked in the property manager's office. Those bastards know. Well, that's my experience with these beings. They are in southern Indiana for sure. You can use my name. I don't care. I know what we heard and felt was real. 
Thanks for listening and good hunting. Dale Carver. Dale, appreciate you, man. And I'm sorry this took, may have possibly took a long time to get to, but I got to it, right? I got it read, read <clears throat> and shared. And I will get every single one of them read, like I've said. But anyway. Okay. Now, on to thy day. Share my story. Excuse me. I just ate my late, late breakfast, too. Share my story at howtohunt.com. All right? That's where you're going to get what you know or what you want to get off your chest shared word for word. Okay? Get it into me. I probably got a bunch of other stuff to report with, but I'm too far behind and I got to go. <laughs> so I'll be back again later.